Hello, everybody, and welcome to our seminar for this evening, STEM Education That Matters, Transcultural Curriculum Thinking. I'm sure you can read that, but I just want to be able to say it out loud. So this is the third in our four series of four seminars for the year. And what we've done is choose, chosen capabilities from the general capabilities from the Australian curriculum and highlighted their connections with um, STEM education. So previously we've had sessions on digital technologies, personal and social capabilities, tonight about um, cultural curriculum, connections with culture, and our final seminar will be on creative and critical thinking later in the year. So anybody who is actually registered for this session will get a link that connects them for the videos for the other sessions if you want to be able to catch up on those or also to be able to have a look again at what happened tonight. My name is Mandy Berry and I'm a professor in STEM education here in the Faculty of Education. And um, I'm very excited about tonight's seminar because there's a lot of mystery that's surrounding it. So when we were asking the organisers to tell us some things about what was happening, they said, well, you can say it's a hypothetical. You can say that there's going to be some audience involvement to some extent. And you can say that the person who is going to be leading us off is the, is the, the premier of a small at all in the Pacific, but that's all that I know. So I'm waiting with you to experience this special seminar. Also, we have online with us people who are participating from actually a unit that, uh, that Roland and I are teaching. So hello to all of those people from the STEM certificate. So that's great. And to all our other online participants. So don't think you're going to get away with it because we're actually going to be including you in our discussions this evening. And finally, I'd like us to think about the land on which this beautiful building sits and to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation and to pay our respects to their elders past and present to welcome any of the Kulin Nation people or relatives who are here tonight. So after that introduction, I'd like to welcome Premier Naranjan Kassaneda, who is here to get us started with our seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Well, welcome to the country of my parents' birth. Not my birth, my parents' birth, but it's a country that I believe so much in. It's a beautiful place. It's actually sort of, oh, I suppose, maybe an hour's flight off the coast of Queensland. It's in a tropical area, but it's a very unique place. It's a very special place to me. It's also a very special place to the people who have lived here for the last 50,000 years, because it is a place that has been through a great deal in its time. What can I say about this country, if we can get the thing to work. It is an atoll, but we call it atoll, atoll, and we are atollians, and we are inviting you both here and online to be, to learn something about atoll. It's a beautiful place, as you can see, this is a, a, a simplified map. It looks like a typical tropical island with a coral reef and so on, but it's more complex than that. It's more complex because there are hidden parts to it, both in its geography, in its community, and in its atmosphere. What do we have in this country? We've got beautiful beaches. We have a central island, a, a, a mountain of sorts. It ha we have uh, coral caves. We also have a great deal of animal life. You wouldn't know it uh, from this um, picture, but we have a very complex ecosystem in the forests that are, um, are around. It is a very unique place. It has some species that are not found anywhere else in the world. And for that, we are very proud. We are a very proud people because we had certain um, um, places on this island that we uh, consider to be most important, not only for us, but for the world. It's a very historical place. We have been the centre of an international trade system for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Even though it is a coral atoll, it has a sheltered harbour. Very few sheltered harbours in this part of the world. 
it, its location is central between Southeast Asia, Australasia, Central Asia, on the way to Europe. So it's been, been uh, desired by many peoples. We have a good water supply, surprisingly enough for a tropical island, but we have a very good water, um, uh, water supply. Very good fertile soils. We have fish off our um, um, uh, coasts. We also have found some minerals, not only offshore, but uh, um, onshore. And we have a World Heritage Coral Reef. So the world knows about us to a certain extent. We have a strong agricultural base. Tourism is very strong, but we have industry here too. We are one of the internet powerhouses of the world. Our people are some of the most educated people in the world. We have 99% literacy. We have beautiful resorts that people come and visit from all over the world. We specialize in high-end tourism, but we also cater for families from other parts of the world. We encourage family life on Atoll. As you can see, it is a beautiful place. We can um, emphasize the peace and the quiet. It is a place to recover from the um, dynamic part of life in other parts of the world. However, we are not, as some people might think, an underdeveloped country. We are a very forward-looking country. We have specialised farms looking at high-intensive um, crops that are exported all over the world. We have high-tech industry in um, uh, various uh, locations. We do not want to stop development in this land at all, but we are very proud of what our place is. We do have industry, we need power. So we have to balance this out. We know that we are balancing out the demands of a uh, modern uh, economy with the need to keep the environment um, clean and pristine and to allow us to do the things that we do. We are also a very forward-looking um, country, economy. We're looking at actually developing these kinds of new cruise ship terminals because they are designed especially for tropical island uh, ecology. We do not want the cruise ships to have huge terminals that actually take up our land and dominate the, the um, uh, landscape. We're looking to develop new ways to bring people to our island and experience it without damaging what we have. But I gather that there is somebody here who wishes to add something to this. Gillian Kidman, you have a, a proposal that you wish to bring to the government of Atoll, I believe. Yes, I do. Thank you, Premier Casanada. And I'm very pleased to be able to visit your little atoll. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say hello to all Atollians that you have there and to anybody who is visiting us or involved in this evening's uh, decision online. Maybe I'd turn the page. Some of you may have recognised my surname, Kidman. I'm from S. Kidman & Co Holdings, my family's, my husband's family um, business. And recently, in the last two years, we have sold a lot of our land. We started in our land, oh, just over 100 years ago, I suppose, and we are big cattle merchants, cattle king, cattle runners but we need a sea change. And so what we've decided is we will sell to Gina, to Gina Reinhardt and the um, Chinese government, Chinese landholders, and so we are cashed up and looking for a sea change. So what we're going to do is come into your atoll and we're going to develop it. We are going to make it beautiful. Let's just have a look at what some of our plans are. As Premier Casanada has pointed out, you have some beautiful beaches. We like beaches, we'll leave those. You have an internal lagoon. It's pretty much a swamp. I wonder if my pointer works. Yeah, pretty much an internal swamp. We've also got a problem. No, it stopped working. Okay. The internal swamp, we're going to drain it. My own family comes from Holland and we are famous for building dikes, for land reclamation. 
we will just drain it all, fill it in, and improve the, the usage of the island. What else can we do there? You've got some industry. We, can, we need your electricity. We might just improve the life for the people. This is the swamp that we're going to reclaim. It's pretty still, stagnant water. Not used for much. Oh, the occasional person might go and swim there. We'll build some swimming pools. We'll make them free. Nice chlorinated salt water swimming pools. Take away your, your um, swampy lands. This is the city. This is part of the city that we will build. We've got down in the bottom right-hand corner a lovely tea house. I love my tea. Finest brewed tea that you'll ever find. Beautiful china cups. Up in the top centre, we have plans for the most elegant opera theatre you have ever seen. The, the brilliance of European opera will be there for you to all enjoy. What else have we got there that might be of interest to you? We have a school, school down there in the, the bottom right. The school will teach STEM. There'll be science on offer, technology. You can actually start an engineering degree in our school and then continue to finish your degree when you go on to the university. It'll be STEM. If you don't want to do STEM, you can go to the community school. We'll still cater for you, but I'm believing that everybody will be on my, on my doorstep, knocking at the door to come into the STEM school. We have a few swimming pools up there. Nice paved roads, all be very geometric. It'll be a beautiful place. This is another aspect of your, your city now to come. You have the town hall, the town clock. We've got a rugby field, cricket pitch, the observatory over on the right hand side, beautiful landscape gardens. You won't find any weeds or introduced species, It'll be all very pristine. But I need your help. I want to actually develop this land to make it something that I'd be proud to live on. I have a vision for it, but I need your assistance so that you can tell me what the important aspects of the redevelopment of the island are. What do we need to take into consideration or the atoll? So when you came in, you identified with one of the disciplines for STEM. I'm a scientist, so I took blue. We have red technology people in the audience. We have green engineers and yellow mathematicians, all people eager to come to my STEM school. Excellent. We'd like you to give your feedback via the online Kahoot system. For those folk who are online, if you identify with being a scientist, can you please log into bit.ly forward slash STEMINAR, S-T-E-M-I-N-A-R hyphen S-C-I. If you are identifying with technology, can you please log into bit.ly S-T-E-M-I-N-A-R hyphen T-E-C-H. Engineering people, B-I-T dot L-Y, S-T-E-M-I-N-A-R hyphen E-N-G. And if you're a yellow mathematician, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash S-T-E-M-I-N-A-R hyphen M-A-T-H. So I'd like you just to give me a little bit of assistance. Tell me what three things that you feel are the most important 
for your discipline that we need to incorporate into my plan to develop or redevelop at all. We really need to make it come forward out of where it's been for, oh, I don't know, several, I can't remember what your Premier said, that doesn't matter. I don't care about how long it's been around. We need to look to the future. The future is to develop the atoll and make it beautiful. So you're asking for input from these international experts here? I am indeed, right, Premier, sir? yes. Okay, so we could have those, not only online, but those of you here, to enter your thoughts on Gillian Kidman's plan for atoll. We'll give we'll you a few you minutes to do few that, minutes. I think. A few minutes. Yeah. Well, whilst you're doing that, I might just describe some of the, the new housing arrangements. Where I'm going to live, perhaps, you know, you can get an idea, well, do you want to come and live on my newly developed atoll as well? So this is the houses that are currently on the atoll. Okay, a bit of a thatched roof of sorts. On stilts, you can see the stilts in these, um, this particular example are starting to be eaten away by the salt water. We can improve on that. You've got a little bit of an outdoor deck. You can take your esky out there. But you notice, you know, it's, it's not modern. There's no air conditioning. It doesn't look like any electricity is going in there. I don't know what the sanitation is like. It's very, very primitive. Certainly, I wouldn't want to live there. I wouldn't even go there to, to, for a holiday. It needs to be improved. I think the only positive thing there might be a fresh coconut from the tree. So this is what I'm going to bring to the atoll. A floating house. This is my new house. I've had a developer design it for me. Latest mod cons. Freshwater swimming pool. I've got a little balcony. I've, I've taken, taken some of the, the local architecture into mind, and I've got some thatched roofs on my little huts beside my uh, pool. Excuse me, no, I've had enough of this. I've been standing here listening to you for the last 10 minutes, and I cannot wait any longer because this is not good enough. Why? Because this is the destruction of what makes Atoll Atoll. What right have you got to come in here and tell us as a, uh, a community how to develop our place? I have the we right are, because I have the money. We are a multicultural society. I'm Ms. multicultural. I've got we mixed have, heritage. Excuse me, go in. My name is Joe Wright. I'm a traditional owner here in Adol, uh, traditional owner uh, amongst the Adolian people. And there's a couple of things that I feel that you have not considered, I'm afraid. I haven't finished. You have an amazing development that you want to put forward, but have you not thought of the cultural richness that already exists here on Atoll? But it doesn't suit me. I it doesn't I suit you. That's right. And where do you come from, Gillian? You do not come from a doll. No, and what no, no. you have failed to consider is your implicit, maybe perhaps naivety, but definitely arrogance, is going to put our way of life in danger. We have a rich, diverse culture that has existed for tens of thousands of years. Just to sort of... Um, my culture exists My colleague well. Jai is speaking here, Gillian. Jai is the leader of our traditional owners. We are speaking now. This is our land. And we I want to buy We are speaking it. now. This is a land where we've had a history, not only of the traditional landowners, we've had um, waves of migration, Arab traders, Sudanese traders, Indian traders. It was a colonial power, um, 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 uh, colonised place from Britain and Holland maybe at one stage, but we've moved beyond that. I was born in England, yes, that is true. My parents were born here, but I'm really proud of the cultural mix. And Jai is about to tell you exactly what that cultural mix means to our people and our community and your plans. Jai, please go on. Our way of life has existed here for thousands of years. People who understand 
the significance of the nature, the flora and the fauna on this piece of land. This very piece of land that contains stories that are unique to this very place. Stories that are unique to the very cultural heritage of our people. Stories that cannot be carried on with your development. Excuse me. For you to come in with your own rules, your own ways, your language, your laws. What's wrong with my language? Your language? Well, let me put something to you. Do you understand the connection between language and culture? The minute you start actually impressing your language upon a people, impressing your language, it means that somebody else's language and their culture starts to diminish. As we've seen in other parts of the world that have been colonized, say, for example, Australia, We've seen a direct correlation of culture diminishing amongst the indigenous peoples in those parts because we have impressed a value system that is directly correlated with that language. That's right. Your language comes with a value system, a value system that may not actually consider the significance of the people and the ways of life that have already existed. For example, you come in here with your laws and you might say, okay, this is my development. Now I make all the decisions and you're going to live within these boundaries and you're going to do things these ways. Who are you to say so? But I have the money. I can do it. You have the money, but what is money to us? What is your money to us? Perhaps our own systems, our own economy might be an agricultural economy. Did you tend to think of that yourself? Oh, yes. My, my family comes from the Kidman Holdings. We're right into agriculture and... Who? Kidman Holdings. I'm not quite getting it. What you're missing, Gillian, is that Atoll has a whole range of people who respect the histories of all those communities. We mingle our languages. In fact, our language of Atoll respects all the cultures that have been there uh, in the past and that are, are, are um, there now. We have developed our own language that mixes up. We are you, very you similar to... Language. We you are very similar language. maybe in some ways to a place like uh, New Zealand or Barbados where the, all the various peoples who have come to that island have actually managed to create a joint community. And what you want to do is to impose your vision of what you call a STEM project yeah, on, on development us. is STEM. Didn't we just point out that we have industry here already, that we have chosen to be here? And I'm not shutting it down. I'm going to use it to my benefit. We will decide, though, what kind of industry we want in our land. Isn't that right, Joe? That's right. Have you Why considered you a treaty? Have you Why considered the... coming to the table and asking us about our laws, our way of life, how we value things here? No, I, didn't, I don't need to. No, that's right. My own ideas, and I've got the money and the power. The Have you considered the implications of building your opera house on our most fertile soil? Have you considered the implications of bringing in your cattle and how that affects our crops, our soil, our health? Have you considered you how it diminishes the reputation milk? of our way of life overall? You it might just actually cease this heated. Um, Roland, have we managed to get the uh, results of those surveys? Can you transfer them to the screen so we can see what the international experts think are important with this? I bet you they'll be on my side. I, quite possibly. That doesn't make yeah. them right. No, but STEM. STEM is the most important. Why? You can, you can have all your cultural Why? stuff. Why because STEM important? Why? Why? Everybody's hearing about STEM. So the engineers, impact, impact on the swamp, affect natural increase, biodiversity, ecological. Interesting, they're sort of competing words there, but they're all about, there's no, no mention there of people. Do you see any mention there of people, Gillian? People change. People aren't important in, in terms of making my, de my de Let's look at the mathematicians. Oh, the word person. Maybe some mathematicians, I did not believe that. Some mathematicians might actually think of people. But look, technology is up, redevelopment. 
total, many, many costs, co finance. We don't believe that money is everything, Gillian. Can we see the next one, please, Roland? Oh, right. I say, I'll, I'll, um, yeah. Engineers, my God, only resource and energy. Is that all you think of? Mathematicians, technology. No, 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 no. The engineers in these little writing, tiny writing, they've got transport. These are the big words. This is what they really think, Gillian. But transport it's is all there. about Someone resource and energy. No. And that's all there is. Somebody said Let's transport. call in somebody you else who knows about the community. You um, cannot um, dismiss Xu Hung. Xu Hung. Yes. Who? He is, is our minister. Can we put the slide back, please, Roland? Shawang is our minister for community and right. understands the connection between the people of this island and the economy and the way in which we live more than anybody else. Your Excellency, Mr. Kwasanada and uh, Ms. Kitman and Jai, our head of our um, Indigenous People uh, Council, um, I'm here to present alternate views. And I must share a very dark secret with you before I go on. I was an academic before I became a politician. And I'm sharing with you very important perspective that I had while I was an academic. I was a geographer. I still am. And I think that we need to think beyond just people, energy, resources. We need to also think about what Jai said about us being an island and people on the island. We are not the only people on Earth. No, we have an I Earth. Agree. You know, it's a bigger place than just our island and probably bigger than Australia. And we need to understand that we're not just citizens of one place, but citizens of the world. We need to have global understanding because our local actions Whatever you do on this island is not just going to stop on this island. And as Minister of Community, I'm concerned first and foremost with our community. But I think we have a responsibility also to the rest of the world. Let me elaborate. Like Premier, I wasn't born on this land. I was born in another island nation in somewhere in the tropics called Singapore. And I'd like to share some examples I've learned from that small little island state that has a lot of bearing on us. And if you see from my slides, I come prepared with actual facts, unlike pretty pictures, trying to sway us into doom of destruction. But never mind. So we have the importance of thinking about global while being local. And if you are aware, we have this International Year for Global Understanding. From the perspective of geography, right, we're not just the only people living on this island. What we do here has impact on the world. What the world does has impact on us. And it connects us at different scales. So what you showed us was one swimming pool, just one swimming pool on that map. I but we had a big lagoon huge lagoon which you know there's life in that lagoon if you didn't know it's a swamp no it isn't there are 126 different species of crustaceans please do your homework we could eat them some are poisonous go ahead <laughs> did you hear what he said who are you going to learn that knowledge by when you take over our island and kick us out well, it's all right. Entrepreneurs are really, out. they I'm talk when you talk. In. You're destroying what we have built up. You are destroying what we know. You are going against all the knowledge and the experience that our community, made up of so many different peoples and so many different backgrounds, <coughs> has built over the last several thousand years. I'm taking you forward into the 21st century. That's your view of what's, what's forward. We yeah. will have a different view. Okay. I'm only interested in my view. Not yours. Can I talk? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm just going to stop here in my role and just going to test the audience's understanding. This is after all stamina, right? So you know I'm really an academic. Sorry, out of row for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Atoll is actually Singapore, 720 square kilometers. Taiwan is about 36,000 square kilometers. The United Kingdom, much bigger. Well, so all of our food, 99% of our food is imported. 
Now, you know, atoll as a nation probably has a lot of fish resource, but Singapore just buys everything. And one of the things that we buy, uh, it's chicken. So I just want a quick quiz before I go on to my point. Which country do you think we import most of our chicken from? And I've got a little gift, a stress ball <laughs> of a globe. And if you know, I'll let you have it. Yes, we have one ticker. China. China, nope. Any other guess? Australia. Not Australia. Indonesia. Nope, not Indonesia, but close. Malaysia. Malaysia. Malaysia sounds like the most natural thing now. Sorry. One last one. Nope. Okay, I'll, I have to give this out, so keep going. <laughs> it's in South America. Brazil. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back on roll. So in a small island, right, like Singapore, where they have, and we too in Atoll have to import quite a bit of other food other than the fish that we catch. You would see that we have to bring things from as far as Brazil. And we never consider for a moment that having all this food come in has a cost. Hmm. And the cost is, we don't know where it comes from, although we know it's Brazil, but it's all already cut up and it's all in frozen packs. We got to defreeze them and so, what we ended up with is just chopped pieces. We don't have free range chicken like that. Basically it tastes much better, but we don't have free range chicken because we don't have the space for it on top. As it is, we have one food problem and that's chicken. We have to import most of it. Now if you're gonna fill that inland lagoon and all our crustaceans are gonna die, our fishes are going to die, we would have nothing to eat. We'll have to end up with packets of frozen fish. Is that what we want? Yes, there's some very nice fish that comes out of the North Sea. <laughs> I'll let you speak for yourself. Can you hear this woman? You Do you want me to turn up my microphone? Like. You can hear me. But better? there is another problem, right? That kind of development, cutting out our food sources at a national level, it's Bad enough, we have got to import food from elsewhere, from internationally, so our own action is going to kill ourselves. Worse yet, if you are talking about STEM, yes, yes. you say you're a scientist, oh, yes. can you explain to me, I was visiting Taiwan. This is on 21st of December, on winter solstice. This is not Australia. If it is Australia in Brisbane, if it's 30 degrees Celsius, you can explain why. This is a subtropical island. It's supposed to be winter. How can you explain this? Do you know what's happening there, scientists? Kitman? So you're saying that December 21 in Taiwan is winter time? Yep. The thermometer was wrong. It was upside down. You didn't read it correctly. You're a scientist who say that you read the thermometer upside down. No, you read it upside down. So, so you, you think it's 30 above? I didn't use a thermometer. Oh. I used a weather tracker, which is digital. Don't that tell me I read it upside down, it was supposed to be zero three and it's three zero. No. Madam scientists, it was an El Nino year. Oh. Do you know that reducing biodiversity, even on a small atoll island, would have an impact on the global carbon cycle? I'm sure you are one of those folks that would pull lots of money and, and, and get companies to create research reports that say that this has got nothing to do with global warming, but... No, 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 it doesn't, doesn't have it at all. Oh my God, listen to her. Global I think you've just spoken for my course. And there is this problem. You keep thinking that if you buy research data and buy researchers on your site to go on your course to say that this has got nothing to do with human activity, whatever development you do on a small island nation like ours, I think you have a big problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you this particular diagram. It just goes to show how narrow-minded some of our scientists really are. They fool us into believing that these kinds of graphs are great. Sorry, Australia is right at the top there. But <clears throat> <laughs> <clears throat> My colleagues from the United Kingdom are fooled into believing that they're okay. When they do this, they have only got 8.5 metric ton carbon emissions per capita compared to, say, Australia. Terrible place, actually. That's where you come from, right? I'm, I'm moving. 
<laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't take that. Now, what UK, what they didn't report about UK was that there is a whole lot of carbon emissions that have been exported because they have imported goods from elsewhere, like China. Where did all the carbon emissions go? So what we are ended up with is we are having inadequate geographies. You're using science without understanding the impact at the local and the global community. And that is one of the problems that we have to tackle, of course, over and above the land and the people. So that 8.5 is a lie. It's much bigger than that because we basically exported all the emissions to Australia. Australia is basically suffering because of that. I also want to point you out to a group of global scientists working on this. They're called geographers, and they have a charter talking about what we need to teach our children. And if you're a scientist and you truly believe that our children need to learn about our world, then you know that we need to be responsible for our world. That's what we teach our children. We will teach that in our STEM school. Yeah, but in you're not school, learning it yourself. Strand. But you're not learning it yourself. I think no, we need to, to educate you. Uh, maybe you should go back to school. Oh. Reading a thermometer upside down. You were reading the thermometer upside down. Can't believe this kind of uh, trivial squabble, but anyway. Two points I raised. Climate change, food security. And if these two points are not convincing to our people, I don't know what will. I think we need to think really deep about why we need to protect our world, not just our island, but the world we live in. Because we are protecting this not just for ourselves. Your development is going to give us very nice places to live in. But what about our children? You're destroying the world for them. How are we going to teach them to be better citizens if we are destroying the world for them? As a community, as a global community, I think it's important that we need to lead by example. Our children need to learn that they have to protect the world. They have to be responsible. They can't walk away thinking that stuff like that happens because STEM educator like you, sorry, a STEM person like you, is tricking us with all those lies, telling us, confusing us about this so much so that some of our children think that the hole in the ozone layer is causing the world to warm when it's really all the industries and all the development you're putting in place. They forget fundamentals like the natural greenhouse effect. That's in my curriculum. And you, you taught them that it's about this? Well, there's a hole. Yeah, there is a hole, definitely, yeah. in your logic. <laughs> What you have done as a scientist by piecing all together these various small little information together is really to trick us at a bigger level. You are promising us an island that is beautiful, etc., but you're going to destroy our lives, destroy our homes. What are you are putting together? I'm, them. I'm not destroying. I'm removing and replacing with something better. So you end up having uh, with a pig that we can have meat from that can lay eggs and produce milk. So that'll solve the problem when I drain the lagoon. You are living in a world of fantasies, much like the people who call this animal. I can't pronounce it, by the way. But it's an egg-laying wool milk shower, translated from German. You're much living in like a fantasy, aren't you? We don't have such a world. And research has shown that the concerns of the people around the world by Kidman and... Uh, that's not you, by the way. Oh, I thought <laughs> it was. Her, by the way. <laughs> These are the kinds of co concerns we have. Our culture, Jai has said, our culture, our environment. These are the kinds of research that people are interested in. But look, the top one was syllabus, textbooks. They want the education. They want the STEM school. Yes, they do. But then you do a word cloud on that. You'll see that apart from education, it's about sustainable development, not no, it's just, just development, development. development of the atoll. 
What it's about, about the Edmund? education that we already have, the education that we pass down generations upon generations, the education that is very much integrated into our own lives. So you can teach science on an intellectual level, but unless you have a system in which to apply it to people's lives, you then create problems, problems such as climate change, because suddenly people don't actually really understand in their body what they're learning. It's all up here, but it's not here, and it doesn't go out there. That's because they're not going to a STEM school. Well, you but said you've gone to school. Your argument, Jai, is on the basis of living in this underdeveloped... Who says it's, not... it's underdeveloped? I just did. Weren't you listening? Your criteria are irrelevant to us, though. We don't judge our level of development by your standards. Perhaps we're happy. What makes STEM education so much better than other forms of education? Well, there's science in it and there's technology. So? The whole world is on technology. There's a lot People, more in the world. How many of you have a, have there's a mobile a lot phone? more in the world than science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And what is technology but what we do to solve human problems? Perhaps the technology that we use here on this island is sufficient for solving the problems that we have faced right here on Atoll. But I can fix it. I fix can solve what? your problems. The ones you were just talking about. You can't fix this. Look at this. What is this? This is a graph showing how our climate has changed. A lot of people say that, you know, our climate has changed because it's becoming hotter. Well, other people are saying, no, it's cooler, cooler in some other places. It's really like a distribution of weather. Not only are you going to have more hot weather, you're also going to have more extreme hot weather. And there's yet another version that's in which you that you're going to get. And have air conditioning. Yeah, that's the problem. Air conditioning is this blue graph over here. You create a fake average, but you basically have a lot more right in the center, which means that a whole lot of the cooler climate in the past and a whole lot of the warmer climate in the past are now gone. So. Air conditioning only protects you indoors. Walk outdoors. Well, looking at you so pale, you probably don't go out at all. <laughs> oh, you could do this. STEM education. This is the place I was born in. It's called Singapore, right? It's tropical. So they, they don't have any cherry blossoms. So what did they do? They big, uh, built a big enclosure called this thing, called the Gardens by the Bay. Full and development. They, yeah, and they put it at 18 degrees Celsius throughout the year, and then they brought in cherry blossoms. Yeah, you're just living in a world of lies. I just want to make it... Just like the people there in Singapore. What's wrong with opera? What's wrong with cricket and rugby? There's nothing wrong with those things at all, because I, as I said, I was born in England. I love rugby. I love cricket. You love but, opera. But, no, I do not like opera at all, actually. But, as Jai pointed out, it is our cricket, it is our rugby, it is our life, not yours. But I want to share it with you. Then you and share I want to our life it. and you integrate with us and take what we have. Why don't you want to take what I'm offering? Because it's wrong. It's wrong. I'm just going to sit down. I don't... Oh, it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> So that is naturally the end of the um, hypothetical. We're going to leave it there. Um, thank you. And we're going to move into the end part. This is the question in which we wanted to sort of, we hadn't quite ended yet, but um, as a STEM expert, well, it was really interesting when we did those word clouds, we didn't know what was going to happen. But what, was, what happened was what I, I certainly hoped and you'll hope what happens, that was that really it came back very clear, there was very little mention of certain things. And Roland, are you able to pull up the word clouds and show it on one side of the, of the screen, please? Not on both, but just on, on one. Um, but that's the question we would pose to you. As STEM experts, people who are interested in STEM education, how would you resolve these things? Can you show it on one, please, Rowan? Uh, no, I'm not sure. It's okay. Okay. So just to, to remind you there, okay, what was really interesting was how few things the... My father was an engineer, um, by the way, so, <laughs> but really how limited the engineering uh, perspective is. 
I was really intrigued because I didn't uh, expect math, uh, in the um, math, math group to have person in the middle of it. That struck me as being really um, interesting. But technology stands out, future, impact. What kind of impact is that scientist, good or bad? And as we, we try to point out, the uh, benefit is um, on the, um, in the eyes of the beholder. Can we go back, please, Ron? So, Gil, you want to come up and we're going to give these two provocations for the... So here are the provocations. Now, this is what White's called a transcultural a seminar. The idea of transculturalism, which I use in, 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 in the sense of culture, it means the acceptance of diversity. And we're saying that any form of investigation whether it's STEM or not, needs to accept that all forms of knowledge, regardless of their source, have equal validity. You don't make judgments about the validity of the data based purely on what might be called Western scientific principles. So diversity of knowledge is the normal state of the world. You can't parcel things off and say, well, we'll only focus on, on certain things. But the second provocation is the real one. <laughs> I'm going to lead into the uh, Q&A. We're going to say there's no such thing as STEM. You cannot have a STEM investigation because if you're going to integrate and actually look at all of what's happening in a place, it must look at all the various sources of knowledge. So there's no such thing beyond if you like, the various individual uh, disciplines and transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary um, thinking. Because STEM investigation is as bad as a pure humanities investigation. Because what it does when you're uh, investigating complex issues like this is to leave out half, if not more, of the picture. <coughs> and on that point, we're going to throw it open for Q&A. So, who um, will have, who's got the um, mics? So Chantal has a mic, Mandy has, um, has a mic. Feel free to contest, as we hope you do, these art, um, ideas, we'd be very interested. So who wants to actually start off? And online, if you wanted to um, feed questions through, Chantal is at the computer. No one wants to actually start off? Oh, well. <laughs> right. In today's society, we're bombarded. Oh, sorry. In today's society, we're bombarded with data and graphs all the time. And like you said, it doesn't. They 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 make it look like it's all that needs to be done without considering anything else. They're often out of context with what they're talking about. Yeah. And we just get blind and go, "Wow, that looks good. That looks great. Oh, that's the scientists. They must be right." but they, that's only one side of the story. There's a wonderful book by, uh, um, and, um, I think he was actually technically a sociologist, Arjun um, Abhidurai, he wrote a book called The Fear of Small Numbers. And it's really about how the world's economy and whole, whole of the world as a society has now, has now been dominated by the fear of getting numbers that are too small, as in economic um, growth, or um, small as in um, income. In other words, people are looking at the numbers as their actual goals. And, that they, and that's actually what's driving lots of what's wrong with the world, that we are focused on the numbers rather than the meaning behind them. Would you like to sort of... Um... If I could also uh, chime in at this point. I think the idea that I brought out on inadequate geographies could be something that we extend into education in general. It's an inadequate knowledge. Uh, when we're given numbers, whether are big numbers or small numbers, numbers tend to be compelling because they tend to lead us to believe that they must have been researched, so it's evidence in form. So, wow, you know, look at that. It, it looks like we're okay in terms of numbers. But I think we need to teach our children, in this day and age especially, to think beyond facts. The ability to critically analyze the facts and ask questions. That's why inquiry is important. Given certain information, can children ask the right questions and Google the right information? 
Google is often being touted as a solution because you can find anything you like. But my argument here is that children do not know what to Google for if they don't know what they're looking at in the first place. So data can be misleading. So what we need to develop in STEM education, in humanities education, is that inquiry habit, the ability to ask the right questions. And the ability to ask the right questions is built on an experience of asking many questions. So if we don't build inquiry into our curriculum, into the way we do teaching and learning, we're not going to get students to look at the data, look at the big numbers, look at the small numbers, and then ask those important questions. So the inadequate knowledges come about because we take information as is, but we don't ask enough questions. Yeah. Yeah. And your comment of, yes, we've got all this data in this graph, but it's not set into context, and that's exactly what we've tried to present tonight. STEM needs to be presented in context, and that context has to have the actual culture surrounding the situation, surrounding the graphs, mm -hmm. surrounding the problem, whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of ways, STEM is not being considered in that, in that sense. Yeah. yeah, people just aren't being... Um, just to add on a little bit about that, so my name is Jai Wright, I'm a Mananjali Yugambia man um, and my people um, are traditional owners back up in Queensland, um, just off the Gold Coast and inland um, south of Brisbane. So a little bit um, about um, the work that I do, I work with mobs all around the country and in the Torres Strait Islands. Um, and when you start hitting them with this sort of information, um, STEM data and that sort of a thing, it's not relevant to our mobs. It's not relevant to the way that we operate. It's not relevant to the issues and the things that we actually value as people inherently inside of us, how we've learned to deal with the world. Um, we talk about knowledge systems. I was mentioning uh, just a little bit before about um, I was mentioning just a little bit before about integrating into the body and the way that we hand our knowledge in our in Aboriginal cultures in Australia um, is through a story system and a story isn't told just by one person. A story is actually told by a multitude of people within the mob and each of those has a responsibility to teach you that part of the story and make sure that it's actually understood and integrated. So you don't learn the next part of the story unless you've learned a life lesson from that first part of the story and so on and so on. And that's really important for, for us in continuing that tradition because it's about responsibility. It's about um, upholding social structures. Um, it's about making sure that all of us are actually owners of the knowledge that we have. But also another really interesting thing to take away from that is there's no one answer that is expected to come from each of those lessons. We say, okay, you go off and you learn what you need to from that story and your observations and you have learned what you have learned. There's no test. It's simply you are ready when you are ready and you move on to the next part of the story there. And I feel like that's a really important thing to take into account when we're looking outside Western colonial systems of learning that people work in a state of flow that's much different to how, that, uh, to how we're used to understanding here. Yeah. Just to give one very um, relatively recent um, example of how that different concept of what's valid knowledge scientific knowledge has, has had. So the Yorta Yorta people put in a, a claim for the land around the Murray River and the Barmer Forests several years ago, and one of the key bits of evidence that uh, meant that, they, that their claim uh, was um, um, refused by the um, um, courts was simply that there was one diary by a settler who in the, I think the first half of the 1800s, wrote I have not seen any Aboriginals here for a number of years. That had more weight to prove that there was no presence, no continuing presence of the Yorta Yorta in that land, than all the stories, all the actual um, 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 proof that they had in, in terms of where they'd been and what was important, that proved that they had been on that land. The legal system, which is based on that Western sense of what is um, 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 science, so a very cultural view of what science is, said the written word of one white man 
was more important than all the actual um, cultural heritage and consistent cultural um, um, stories and evidence uh, provided by the um, um, people. And that's sort of one classic example of the point that we're trying to actually make. I put up some very contentious things there and I would love someone to actually argue against us. So please. I noticed some, some of the scientists all flinked when I said there's no such thing as STEM. So come on, argue against me, please. <laughs> no one wants to argue the case. Yeah, yeah, it's not oh, so good. much an argue against you. It's um, I, I can't see how it's possible to have STEM without language. Um, STEM depends on definition at some stage or another. So this harks back to what Joe had to say in the first instance as well, that language is an integral part of culture. And I, I just can't see how you can have STEM without language for the definition of it. Thank you. Hmm. Maybe there's something related to the languages of STEM as well. So um, the kinds of knowledge constructions that are part of each of those disciplines have their own languages and ways of working and ways of thinking. So I, I yeah, of course I have a problem with there's no such thing as a STEM investigation because I think, first of all, it's how you construct the notion of STEM, but also that it brings a perspective. It's not the whole picture. And I, and I think we have to be really careful around things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Can tell us a, a question online. Hi, Naranjan. Yes, we've got quite a few people online and they've actually been discussing a lot of your presentation um, at the moment. It's kind of going exploding over here in the chat session. Um, but we do have one question. Um, we've got, what can we do as educators to ensure that students Google reliable information? Well, have you two can take that off. I think that could be um, me. <laughs> about that just now. Um, there's no easy answer. I think um, we have to first uh, examine our own inadequacies and our own ignorance. And I'll start by a story. I arrived yesterday, so on the way to the uh, airport, I was on a cab in Singapore, and yesterday was a public holiday for us. It was the uh, Hari Raya Haji, which basically celebrates the uh, uh, return of people who have gone on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. So I learned for the first time in my life, because I thought I was humble enough to ask, because I was worried about sensitivities, what should I ask about a religious uh, 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 um, holiday? So I asked, I said, you know, I heard about um, goats being used in uh, sacrifices as part of the celebration. And um, I wonder where you got them, because in Singapore it's so ultra-modern. I've never seen even a chicken with feathers in a market. They come pre-cut, right? So I asked, where do you get them? And uh, this driver, the, the Uber driver I was in, it's not a cab, it's a Uber driver, told me that, um, well, actually, we don't really have them because in the past we would sacrifice um, and we would give the meat to someone who is needy, to friends and family. Um, we can still get them if we import them, but we don't really do it anymore. So I say, does it mean that then nobody does that? anymore. No, we do. Uh, we'll go to a nearby island in Bintan and then we'll look for a community and then we will do our, our sacrifice there and we will keep, give the meat to the needy over there. So that humbling experience for me was that I asked questions, right? I wanted to know a little bit more, but I also came from unknown, not knowing enough. So when we get our children to Google for the right thing, we have to play an active role by developing this habit of inquiry. I think I'm repeating a point here about the importance of not just, the importance of not just giving them instructions. So the best example that comes to mind was a colleague of mine shared with me how a science teacher said that it was impossible to do open inquiry in her classroom. To her, inquiry was simply if they do an experiment, they have a hypothesis and they could prove it, that was inquiry. But 
you know, it could be an open inquiry. Based on what you see, can you formulate an inquiry question? We may be disempowering our students if we don't help them ask questions. So Google is an engine, it's a search engine. You need to ask the right question. The classroom then plays a very important role, in my view, in developing the right skills for asking questions. And therefore, you can find them on the internet with that. So take away the internet. I mean, that's basically what Socrates did. 2,000 years ago, sorry, Western colonial thinking. But 2,000 <laughs> years ago, Socrates didn't have, well, they have a tablet, but it doesn't look like this. Um, they didn't have <laughs> technology, but they had the most advanced ideas in the world. They were Plato and Aristotle talked about a spheroidal earth before Copernicus and before Galileo did. So how did they do that? They asked questions. So Aristotle, for instance, say, why is it that uh, the shadow of the earth cast on the moon during a lunar eclipse is always a circle? And by pure induction, by asking those questions, was able to come up with, ha, huh, only a sphere would always cast a circle, a circular shadow. So that's the kind of questions we hope our children will ask. Thank you. Mm. I'm going to have a one more in my classroom. <laughs> thing Microphone, so our colleagues can. I've got a sign up in my classroom. I finally put it up because we're doing curiosity. And I went, eh, what does that mean? And I put, a uh, question leads to an answer, but an answer leads to more questions. And I've got why, what, what if, and all that stuff underneath. And I'm trying to push kids to question everything and ask why. Wonderful. Just starting. <laughs> so you can copy that and put it up on your walls in your classroom. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Chantelle, anything else from uh, online? What's we? No. Oh, right. Sorry. You want a bit of argument? I think you've created a fabulous straw man here based on the assumption that STEM exists in and of itself and that it's science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But if we look at the classic examples of STEM application, and I'm going to use Engineers Without Borders as an example, they are rooted in using STEM to further uh, cultural developments in a way that's recognition of the people that they're helping and ensuring that they come up with a culturally appropriate solution while also promoting technology. It's, but that, and, I, and that's great, but, what it's, but the principle behind that is to accept that those cultural knowledges that they're trying to, to meet exist and, and have value. And that's, that's the point. So that would be a, a, a STEM project that actually did take into account all those things that we've been sort of um, talking about. So, um, yeah, I'm not, not quite sure. <laughs> it's, so it's, I, I would argue that a good STEM solution takes into account cultural factors in and of itself in the same way yes. that it takes into yes. account yes. ecology, yes. technological advancement. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it's, you've created a very narrow view of, of science and technology in your presentation and you've made a fabulous point in the process, hmm. but... I do, I do think you've created a scenario where you're accentuating a negative that doesn't necessarily exist. Now, uh, I'll pass over to, to, to Gil, because she's done the, uh, the research, but basically that's not what's happening in schools. Really? Yeah. The way I see it in schools is that we're, we're instructed or told or the, the perception is there, do STEM, teach STEM. We've got to have STEM teachers. That's great. And I'm all for that. Unfortunately, though, the way that the curriculum is actually structured is you've got science and mathematics and English and geography and all the other subjects, but a lot of the cultural, the um, intercultural understandings part of the curriculum is in or on a separate page in the web. The teachers are informed, you've got to do it, you've got to integrate it, there's given absolutely no help. Yep. And unless they've experience some of the negative sides of the importance of um, intercultural understandings or the, um, 
the issues that we have with the Indigenous peoples, then they just sit with the comfort zone. So often our STEM education is being delivered in terms of science at the base and we'll put in a little bit of numeracy Mm. as in the mathematics, which raises the question, is science, uh, not sorry, science, is mathematics the same as numeracy? Should it be STEM or STEN? These issues are being raised mm. because that natural integration, the awareness of bring the people in, bring the culture in, put STEM in context. And from my personal experiences, what I see, what I read, they're separate. Absolutely. If I can just inter sure. interject just a little bit there. So in my experience, um, so I actually work um, mostly with mobs. Uh, I work with mobs who are looking to be displaced by industries that create climate change, so the fossil fuel industry. And so a lot of the work that we do is we we teach mobs how to campaign, how to be self-determined, and that's for lack of a better word because the English language cannot actually encompass what self-determination and sovereignty really is for Indigenous people around the world. Let's acknowledge that right now. Um, and, and I guess the biggest thing that we face, we have people telling us every day, and I think we're probably going to be in a similar viewpoint here, science is going to solve climate change. You know, we're going to have arcology, we're going to have buildings that are filled with trees and, and we're going to reduce our carbon, um, our carbon emissions and, and all the rest of that there. But unless you have a value system in which to apply the science, you don't have a solution. I can't trust a government to come up with a solution for food security. I can't come up, I can't trust a private company to actually come up and give my mob as much food as they need when we have food shortages. All I can do is say, here's a value system that provides equality, here's a value system that provides equity, and the value system is land. Land is what equalizes us as Indigenous people in the world. It's saying that you can have STEM, but it's flawed to a certain extent in its application if you have a narrow, a narrow view in which you're going to actually apply it. Or like you need to take into account exactly what the people's needs are. And I think that goes a little bit into social justice and all the rest of that there. But um, yeah, for, for us, like for me, that's a reality every day. All I hear from people is, science will solve this. Well, no, it doesn't. Decolonizing your mind will solve it because it gives you a system in which to apply this equally for every single person on this earth. I think the, um, back to your point, I think STEM outside schools hmm. is done quite differently to what's happening in schools. I think that's the actual um, dilemma. Science outside schools is practiced in a quite different way to what happens within schools. And it's the same with uh, geography. It's the same with lots of things. Um, so I'm a um, geographer too. I don't like the way geography is taught in schools. And yet geographers, when they're out in the, in the real world, like scientists, they deal with, with study and research and learning in a quite different way. So yes, I acknowledge what you've um, um, said. Certainly from outside the uh, um, school sphere, I think, uh, STEM is done in a more inclusive way some of the time, not all the time. Oh, yes, go on. Yeah. We've just got one more online, yep. Naranjan. Um, so we've got from Petra. Um, what do you recommend we do in secondary schools and how do we get politicians to change their mindsets? How do we get change? Uh, government for a start, that might help. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Um, it's on. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things that uh, we can do as, and I'm thinking here about all all teachers. I think one of the, um, so I spent what 30 odd years in schools before I um, came here. And one of the most difficult things was to get teachers across the school to work in the way which, where they actually, whether it was science, maths, whatever, to work together to create a school, a whole school uh, a curriculum that made sense, that actually had some um, unity. And 
I'm a believer in science, I'm a believer in STEM, in geography, in all, English history, all those things have that sort of power. But we don't actually ever, I think schools are really bad at this, we don't plan curriculum and teaching on a school basis where things interlock. That does not mean that everything has to be uh, in step, but every discipline goes off and does what it likes according to the uh, curriculum that's being being followed. But for instance, in Victoria, we have a lot of um, latitude as to how we interpret the uh, Victorian uh, curriculum. So curriculum writing and activity writing and so on is a big part of what teachers in this state do, unlike some other states where things are more sort of planned. But no one ever talks to each other. I used to have trouble getting, as I was head of um, humanities, I had business as part of that. I had real trouble talking to the science but, um, heads and the um, maths heads to try and coordinate what we were doing. Because I saw that what I was, we were doing in humanities had great links with science, certainly in undrugly, but also in, in history. But getting teachers to realise they have to collaborate in a meaningful way and not play the politics that so happens um, within schools. And that's one thing I think we do try to uh, develop here, not always uh, successfully, but that teachers have to uh, collaborate. To me, it should be a far more important part of what teacher um, education should be, and that's what I'm trying to do uh, as part of my job. But we, it's no point teaching people how to be good science teachers, history teachers, English teachers, if they don't know how to work within a school environment. Anyone else want to get? Right. Um, Narajan, I think that you've really hit the nail on the head here. I think we could be very fatalistic and say that unless the government do something about it, we can't do anything uh, to make this better. But I think if you've read the McKenzie report, you realise that the quality of any education system cannot exceed that of the quality of its teachers. So teacher quality is extremely important. I think it's not just collaboration, it's teacher professional development within the larger context of teacher growth. It's not just about attending courses. It's not just about collaborating, peer observation of lesson, doing lesson studies and so forth. But there's also the importance of doing action research, community-based uh, professional learning uh, kind of community research that would help you find solutions to the problems and um, I, I thought I said this to someone today, um, that you can have a great curriculum, but if the teachers aren't able to de deliver mm -hmm. that curriculum, it wouldn't help. You can have a terrible curriculum, but you're a fantastic teacher. I'm not saying that we don't need good curriculum, but if you're fantastic teachers, your children are going to learn a great deal from you. And th that speaks to your uh, uh, point as well. Um, that we need to be considering what we put into our lessons. I think we're talking to the choir here because you're here simply because you're interested. But I think that is an important point for our colleagues who have asked the question online, you know, about policy, about government. I think those things are way beyond the control. The only thing that we can change and control is ourselves. So as teachers and teacher educators, mm. we're in the position of change. We are the agency. Thank you. I'd just like to finish up on... Um the, the work, some of, some of the work that Naranjan and I are doing and Roland and others in the faculty is that we're not saying STEM isn't important. It is. Science is important, technology, engineering, mathematics, four discrete disciplines. You have to have a strong discipline base in order to do STEM or to do anything, basically. So we're not suggesting that STEM in its... Um, disciplinary base or any disciplines isn't important. Have that first and foremost in your schools, but then give the students the opportunity to learn to integrate knowledge. It is teamwork that is valued in engineering faculties at university. It is teamwork that is valued once you go out as an engineer to work in the real world. Mm. In science, you work in a team in a laboratory. It is all the integration. It's the inter interpersonal skills that you learn with it. Science doesn't exist on its own. Useless. It's actually a, a fabrication of 
or an interpretation of the uh, real world. But you won't have it. You won't have any of our disciplines unless you look beyond the disciplinary boundary mm -hmm. and start to cross those boundaries. But you have to have that, that sort of knowledge of the disciplines to know how you actually connect the, 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 the uh, um, disciplines. So in STEM, it, the scientists, the technologists, the engineers, and math, they need to actually understand their own discipline and get to understand the disciplines of the others. And then you can come up with a meaningful way of... It's not just adding things on. It's about integrating them so they actually form a cohesive whole. And that is what we're saying is wrong with most, not just STEM, but most integrated uh, curriculum that gets taught in schools these days. It's actually lacking that true um, integration. People just combine content and, and, and say that's STEM, that's humanity. It's not. So, um, it's a mess. You can't just do a science experiment look at the numbers and say, oh, we've got numbers, we'll put them on a graph and we'll talk about it mathematically and say we've got science and maths together, therefore we did a STEM lesson. Mm. And the point made that about um, language is central to, um, to all these things. Yes. How you explain the connections between uh, um, ideas becomes crucial. And people need to have the ability, teachers need the uh, uh, ability, to be able to communicate with each other about the conceptual similarities or uh, connections between their uh, disciplines that they can then use to create good STEM education or good humanities education, whatever the combination is that you're after. So knowing the language of science helps me interpret the language of mathematics, the language of the engineers. Knowing my own language as a human being allows me to listen and understand German. That's what we... Into language skills, sorry. That's where the, no, sorry, that, that's where the transcultural part... It's not talking about culture purely. It's talking about that, that uh, ability to, to, to accept that all things are important and that difference, mm -hmm. knowing about that difference and accepting the difference and then learning how to combine that difference and to transform those, that combination of differences into... Uh, um, something more powerful, that's what will create good STEM education or good, en good any, or any good integrated um, education. Mandy, I think it's... There we go. Oh. Okay. I'm feeling a little bit nervous about my job right now, but anyway. <laughs> We're so, not knocking it, not at all. We need I'm, you, Mandy. <laughs> um, and also, I'd like to acknowledge that there's a lot of teachers who are grappling with these challenges right now in their schools and trying their hardest within the constraints of the curriculum or the other kinds of demands and, try, and making sense of these things. And sort of in a way, it's, it's helpful that there's not... Um, prescriptions about how STEM should be taught or interpreted because it provides opportunities for people to be able to do that. But it's with forums like this, it's with working with others that you can start to open up these conversations and enable people to keep doing the good work that they're doing. And I, I think I'd like just like to acknowledge that there is a lot of great work that's going on and, um, and you know, we're here, here to help promote that, which I'm sure you are too. So we we're in kind of backwards introduction now because at the beginning there was the mystery of what was about to happen with this um, with this um, scenario that you set up and certainly you got us talking and thinking and that was your deliberate ideas and now I can actually acknowledge the people who took this courageous step to do something a bit different um, in order to help us think about the notion of culture and STEM. And I think they set a great example for the kinds of things that we could do in our own classes as well um, as we're working with students to try to embody some of these particular issues and to stand in the shoes of others and imagine what it's like to take that perspective. So thank you very much for um, being brave enough to do this work and to come from Singapore to do this work <laughs> and um, to help us to remember that this is a, an international thing. It's not just necessarily a local thing as well. So I have some um, gifts to give out as I introduce our, especially our guest to Monash. And um, so first of all, Associate Professor Chu Hong Chang 
is here from the National Institute of Education from Singapore, from Nanyang Technical University. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, Chu Hung is a geography educator, as if we couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> and his research area is in climate change education. No surprise there. So thank you so much. <laughs> very, very much. And I'll show you everything in there is completely recyclable and usable for the rest of its life. Yeah. And um, Jai, thank you very much, Jai Wright, for coming along. And um, he is a climate change activist, which I think you already revealed to us when we kind of moved out of character, and also an actor. So obviously doing some great work um, with your people and also trying to educate us in some of the issues that you're trying to manage. And Mananjali, you can be a people, is that right? Yeah. I'm getting close. Um, <laughs> it's good for my um, white Western mouth to try to get around some of these words and to practice them. So thank you to you also for coming along tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And of course, the people who conceived this wicked problem for us tonight, um, Associate Professor Gillian Kidman from Monash, science educator, thank you. And Dr. Naranjan Castaneda, who is Castaneda, always get that wrong, sorry, um, who, who's um, yeah, also curriculum and pedagogy and geography and transcultural and work is your specialty area. Um, also, yeah. And to Roland, who um, did a magnificent job here behind the scenes. Yeah, thank you. To the people who have come here, we hope we have given you some food for thought to take away, some things that you might want to argue over in your own households or take into your classrooms or pin up on the walls. Um, and to the people online, thank you very much for participating. We can see your comments as we're working and you will all get a link to this particular um, event uh, that will be in a couple of a few weeks time as we sort of get that together and a reminder that you'll be able to connect in the other STEM sessions that we've had in CBOs and it's our creative critical thinking final seminar for the year. And Kath, do you know what date that will be? Oh, and with Lucas too, on the 8th of November. So put that in your diary straight away. So thank you for coming. We hope it has been an informative and provocative and helpful night for you. And thanks again to our presenters. You did a terrific job. Thank you. Thank you.